Okay, everyone. Well, welcome to uh, tonight's presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Nick and everyone at uh, Coal 33 for the invitation to come down here and speak to you this night uh, about uh, Frederick Lamont-Santee and some other uh, interesting topics. Now, when I was here a few weeks ago, no, a few months ago, it was a great time. It was summertime. It was a great event. I said, oh, this is just a spectacular venue and a spectacular spread. So just thank you very much. And make sure you guys feel free to get up and go eat while you're here and uh, take some stuff home so I don't have to. Except for that one bottle of wine. I'll take that, okay? <laughs> uh, also, as uh, here's the plug. Uh, Nick has also generously offered to help support the Institute for Medic Studies. Uh, so your purchases of products in the case, the books and collectibles and some of the other items, that goes to help support us. So we appreciate that very much. Now, when I was here, I thought, well, this is just a great topic, local history. And we were just talking, there's so much great local stuff going on. And, and people often tend to think it's always better somewhere else. But somewhere else moves here, okay? And at some point, you have to look at what you've got. And, and we've had some great characters. Santee is one of them. Uh, the book I have over there on... Uh, 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 who was it? Yeah, Lyshevsky. <laughs> I forget his name now. Uh, Lyshevsky. That's a, an interesting character from Carbon County uh, who knew uh, Rigardi and Albertus. And of course, there's uh, the book I have there on Pietism and Pow Wow, which looks at the regional development of these beliefs and also touches upon some things in the Plymouth area. Now, instead of just kind of listening to me ramble on uh, about Santee, what I thought we'd do is I'd have a discussion with Chris Bellardi. Now, Chris is the author of this book. Well, these two books, in fact, this small one, which is a history of Wap Walpen, but also the Red Church. Now, those of you who are interested in Pennsylvania German folk magic will find that this encyclopedic text is worth your time and effort to get. Uh, I strongly encourage you to uh, get a copy, it, particularly if you're interested in the cross I don't want to say cross-cultural studies, but kind of cross-pollination studies with uh, English cunning work, cunning craft in particular, right. and then moving out of that into Appalachian work and uh, root work. And even yeah. hoodoo. And then to some degree, uh, even contemporary witchcraft. That is that, in the 50s. Right. All right. So, so, so Chris is just, uh, oh God, we've known each other far too long. We won't go back. Uh, but what I thought I'd do is we're just going to kind of talk and you're going to eavesdrop and feel free to ask questions, okay? So, and uh, I remember, what was it, 29, 2011, I got that call to be on the History Channel to do that documentary they were doing down in Wap Walpen. They needed a talking that, head. That's right, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that was great because I, I got... I forgot about that. Well, yeah. I got to embarrass my son with that because people come up to me and they say, weren't you on that show? And I say, yeah, this is great. So, Anything that embarrasses the kids is great. Wasn't that, what was it called? The, Coven of the Cat. But it was the, what was the? The Haunted. The, the Haunted the, Animal the, Planet, was yeah, it? Yeah. Animal. That's right. And, and our Gary Hulk was uh, in a... He was, and that is yeah. where I met Gary. That's how you met Gary. That's okay. Right. Yeah. So we were, we were in the same episode. Now, you were, you were also in the documentary on the Hex murder, right? I was, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, Hex Hollow, and uh, oh, that's, I it, should have brought that too. There's so many things to... Wasn't that, yeah, I think that's available on... Uh, Amazon. Amazon, right, Amazon. Yeah. Now, we had this year at the Institute's conference, we had the one of the producers of that came up and uh, talked about the documentary. Right. So, yeah, so it's pretty... It's and it's all an extension of this what we're talking about. In some oh ways. yeah, that that's right. Be Nelson Raymeyer. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the the Hex murder that took place in nineteen twenties. Night. It was nineteen twenty two sticks in my head, but mm -hmm. I guess 22. I have to reference my own book to. Where was this? Uh, Lancaster. Lan Lancaster. Yeah. yeah. It became a national sensation. It was an international sensation, and the. Uh, the governor and many other politicians of the time were so thoroughly embarrassed that Pennsylvania was on the map because of a witchcraft-related murder and that such things were still being practiced that uh, they came down particularly hard on the Pennsylvania German community right down to 
you know, stopping the, the teaching of the language or speaking the language uh, in the schoolhouse or, or whatever, because by then, you know, there was World War I with the Germans and then there's the 20 year hiatus and the continuation of World War I, and, and, you know. And I think at that point we saw, and this is an interesting thing, I've never found one, uh, but they, they were licensing powwow practitioners at that point. There was a yeah, test there you was, could take in Harrisburg. That, and I don't know too much about So if you want that. to be a licensed magician, Harrisburg would stamp off on you if you passed the test, right? Right, and that didn't last terribly long, though. No. But getting back to, uh, uh, to Santee, uh, I had heard stories of him growing up, because this is all part of that folk magical tradition, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a bit of a celebrity in the area. In the particularly in the early 70s into the mid 70s and he died in was it 80 or 1980 in fact it was april 11th 1980 that he passed away okay. and you and i began talking about him we exchanged emails and I exchanged with a few other folks um but how did and, and it reignited my interest but how did you get interested in santa oh goodness when i was yet a student at what was then wilkes college uh, people knew of my interest in the occult and they said, well, have you heard of Dr. San Santi? And I, I was, uh, I said no, and they didn't have much information. And then I was at, a, I was at a nightclub, I forget what the name of it was then. And there was, a, a f I had made a new friend because she was into the, the occult and she said have you heard of about dr santi and that was not long after i had heard about it from somebody at school well uh <laughs> they there's all sorts of rumors and that that's what got around in fact there is an older fellow who's into uh i used to belong to oh excuse my uh my my mind flipping here. Uh, I've been involved in so many things. Uh, has anybody ever heard of Sun Bear? Yes. Sun mm -hmm. Bear. Mm -hmm. Well, his group, I was involved in that in Orange, Orangeville, and the fellow who hosted, he and his wife, he was, ab he was an old Dutchman. He was absolutely scared to death of Santi <laughs> and to go anywhere near <laughs> Walk Wallopen. And the rumor was, was that he worshiped the devil, that he uh, was writing this book called The Devil's Wager, and it was a magic book, a grimoire, and that one, as he was getting closer to having it done, well, his everything caught a light, his house burned down, and Satan took him to hell with him. Uh, and that's what I knew, yeah, this, stuff about that he was buried at midnight and with this coven around him and uh is just but there, there's, it, there's partial truth in the fact that there was he did have the book but it's it was a it's play. something i i it meant is... to bring that today it's it was his he wrote a book called the the devil's wager it's the company went right out of business right after they published it and uh and let's see. But what uh, was the subtitle? A Faustian Tale? Yeah. Something like that. And I want to get it right because I uh, have it right here. And I think it's worth my. Uh, oh, jeez. Okay, I'm going to. I'm going to tell you right off that Doctor Santee was a very eccentric man, and he loved women. And he believed that women were the redemption of humanity and individual men as well. And he, he wrote this, The Devil's Wager. This was one of the, what do they call these? You send them, they used to send them out before a book was published. The press release. Press the release. Yes. And he tried his best to rewrite Faust to the modern day only within the context of of the of marxism and versus capitalism and he was sort of 
Ayn Randian in the, the sense that uh, he was very anti-Marxist and he only saw ugliness in it and he believed that contemporary culture at the time was making women ugly with the types of designers that were coming out and he loved his nurses and secretaries in high heels. That was one of the prerequisites for working with him. And uh, he had a thing for high heels and cats, hence the name of the coven, coven of the cat. Of the cat. Uh, yeah. So, um, I don't know if you want me. Well, want the, book, me the book was the book is is terribly difficult to read. I mean, it's not terribly good. No, uh, it's terribly dry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but if you find a copy of it, grab it because people pay an outrageous amount of money yes. just to have it. Uh, so if you find one, I, I, I met a fellow who burned one. Uh, a, 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 yes, he went to a psychic who told him all his problems would be solved if he burned the book. And at that point, I, when he said that, I, I just looked at him and I, I, I'm seeing these $50 bills burning me. <laughs> uh, I haven't spoken to him since, and that was about 15 years ago. So. But, but back to Santina, his, his story is fascinating because we see him as a child. He's a child prodigy. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. He he went to elementary school. There was an elementary school in Wapwalpin. Wapwalpin is so small that if you even if you're crawling by it, you'll miss it. Mm -hmm. So Won't you accept it at the front door room? Not this front door. Sorry. So anyway. Uh, Oh, where was I? Uh, Wap -wap. His and So he went to elementary school there, and he went to high school all the way in Wilkesbury. And he he was such a child prodigy. I I want to get it right for you. By the eight, uh, I'll. I hope you don't find this boring, but I'm going to read just this one. Um, passage here. Dr. Fred was a prodigy. He was, he was, um, okay, skip a sentence. He could read both English and German at the age of six and learned Latin from his grandfather's grammar books by the age of eight, at which time he tried his hand at translating Caesar's Gallic Wars from Latin and into English just for fun, incidentally. And that was his idea of fun as a child. He began his early schooling in the village, as I said, went to Wilkes-Barre High School. Soon after that, um, he attended Harvard at the age of 14. And shortly thereafter, after he attended Oxford, he was, uh, it was around this time that he went abroad with his mother. He received his BA in 1926, his MA in 1928. By 1938, he had his med medical degree from Johns Hopkins. Now here's a little blurb from the Scranton Times, September 11th, 1920. Frederick Santee, 13 years old, Wap and son of Dr. and Mrs. Santee has matriculated for the regular course at Harvard University, he is the youngest ever to enter as a candidate for a degree. The boy has been unusual since his first day at school and has been able to read foreign languages almost without study ever since he was six years old. And it's, he, when he went abroad with his mother, he came into contact uh, at, during those early years with W.B. Yeats, Alistair Crowley, H.P. Blavatsky. Um, he was a member of the Theosophical Society of England and also went to the University of Berlin. So he was, he was around and his, his biggest dream in life was to teach the classics. He loved, uh, old Greek and Roman, you know, Cicero and Homer and, and all that. And that was the, uh, the main contents of his library, 
uh, the which was up to about 50,000 books. After the, well, I'm skipping ahead here, but there was a fire, uh, an arson in his library, which was an outbuilding, a cinder block outbuilding, and somebody nearly burnt it to the ground. And by the time they extinguished the fire, there was only 24,000 viable books. And over the years, they rot, it was stolen. But the building still exists. I mean, it's still it's there. Back by the house, because the house yeah. is still there. Now, you know, one thing I was, I was wondering is when we look at him, <clears throat> Okay, so he's a child genius. He's immersed in the classics, which is, I think, really important for us to understand today that the, the, when we're dealing with the classics and then we're moving into the Renaissance, we are, um, that is where we're really dealing with magic and occultism. That, that yes. we're, not, we're not dealing with very dry and abstract philosophy. We really are dealing with, for the most part, a study of, of uh, the ideas that we see in, in, all, in the later witch revival. To some, to some greater degree. What point do we, at what point did, does Santee get directly involved in magic? Well, do we know uh, that? Here, uh, during his time in Germany, he was introduced to a group of magicians. Now, according to Gary Lee Hoke, these, these people were actually a witch's coven. Of what sort, I don't know. I, because I wasn't sure, I just put down magicians. Who, is, who it is said were located approximately 30 miles outside of Berlin. The group was headed by a magister by the name of Arnold, Arnold Reinman. The American uh, archives, uh, the archives of American art retain some of the old correspondence Fred, from Fred's um, 1926 to uh, corresponds with Dr. I think it's pronounced Gregusi regarding his desire to study in Germany. I shall be in Rome then, and he's speaking to the doctor, 1st of October. My parents want me to come home for this summer, but I, tr I am trying to convince them I ought to study in Germany. I'm thinking of Freiburg or Heidelberg chiefly. I'm afraid because I like the towns. It is too hot to go to Greece, and I shall have an, uh, I shall have other opportunities. And somewhere along the way, I don't know when, he was in Egypt, and he was he took initiation into a Sufi order. I've never been able to find out which order that was. You know, when when I read in, in Gary's book about the uh, because we have a name and we have a location, Berlin and fell. Uh, I had wondered if that might have been uh, the Fraternitatis uh, Saturni. It could very well have been. And I, I did contact one of the few people I know who has some <coughs> relationship there. And uh, they weren't able to, to provide any information because uh, you know, it had been a long time. But uh, there are two other people that I'm trying to follow up on and, and find out you know, if where to see where we can connect him, connect those I, dots. I, I could him. never find out who this magister was Reinman, Arnold Reinman. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. When, when he was studying out in Germany, right, and it says, you know, he was out so many miles away from Berlin, would that have been in the area of, like, the Black Forest, which is um, out in Germany? No, the Black yeah. Forest would have been much further to the south, southwest, yeah. By where? By Freiburg. Actually, he would have been near that if he went to Freiburg. Freiburg, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure how far the Harz Mountains are, though, from Berlin. That, that mountain range, I don't know how far that is. Sure. But we have to have a direction. Right. We don't have a direction on it. Now, if I rem the, the direction that comes into my mind is north. I remember, I, maybe it was Gary or maybe it was Janie Kishbaugh who said that it, where he studied or where he was in this group was north of Berlin, which means absolutely nothing to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Janie, let's, I remember you introducing me to her. You That's right. You visited her many years ago. We went to her house in Askebeck. Yeah. And I remember seeing, uh, I believe, I don't know if it was hers or your copies. It, it, it doesn't really matter, but some of the rituals right. that the group did. Maybe we could talk about Janie a little bit and, and her relationship to the doctor and then uh, 
how that fits into oh, me, absolutely. just like the broader the broader social fabric it's, uh, of, of the Covenant Academy. Without uh, mentioning Janie is only telling half the story of Dr. Fred. Uh, Janie acted as a nurse slash secretary for him, and he, they also considered themselves soulmates. Meanwhile, they were married to different people. Uh, from what I understand, that, that it was totally platonic, but that, that's neither here nor there. Uh, he was, Dr. Santee, since he was involved and knew all of these other people, Crowley, Blavatsky, Yates, and, and such, he, I looked at some of his earlier writings and they were more high magic oriented. Kabbalistic. It wasn't until his girl, his girls, uh, his uh, his secretary, his his other nurse, that that they they practically hung on his leg to to get into wicker. And at that time, it was brand new over here. And at the time, there were really only. The, the people who were known the most for the religion over here at the time was Sybil Leake and Ray Buckland. And this was something that very much appealed to Janie and the, the other uh, ladies. And Dr. Santee's view of women uh, as, a, as the redeeming principle for humanity. So he, he called, they made contact with Sybil Leake, who was very amiable, and she showed up. She showed up with her son, Julian. This was in the early 70s. And uh, when Gary was still alive, he made contact with Julian directly. And he said, of course, I remember Wop Wallop. And who can ever forget a name like Wop Wallop? And, <laughs> And so that, that's how they came to have a coven and they were all into cats. Uh, and it was just natural for them to name the coven, the coven of the cata, which sounds like Sybil Leake's old coven from the New Forest, mm -hmm. the coven, mm -hmm. the Horsa coven. Yeah. And, and this was a big deal. This wasn't just like they just visited. Uh, there was uh, an interview, there were pictures That's in the right. newspaper, and her publicist, I remember this because as, as an author and as a published author, her publicist came along on this trip. That's right. Yeah, this, is, this, was, this was big news, this was big photo opportunity. So how Wop Walton suddenly becomes this locus of, of a cult uh, popularity is interesting. And, and people, even though Dr. Santee mm -hmm didn't make a lot of money being a doctor. In fact, he didn't even want to be a doctor, but he studied for it anyway. And his, his father was a doctor and his grandfather was a doctor and his grandfather was a doctor during the Civil War. So he went into the practice, took over his father's office in Wapwalpin, and he did most of his work gratis and that, that's what kept him poor as a doctor because everyone around there didn't have two nickels and so he would treat people for free or on account or whatever. And uh, so at, before Janie and the other girls, they started to, you know, started to get him into this. He was more or less an armchair magician speculative uh, I don't know that he actually did anything but he had circles in the basement I think prior to Wicca it was just uh, the circle on the floor was it was black and blue the, mm -hmm. a double circle black and blue and, and yet though there there are these spectacular there it's interesting you're not certain what he may or may not have done and yet we have other people talking about his his extravagant occult abilities 
and we have to wonder. I mean, I, I did see some of the documentation. Now, I remember from my, my great uncle uh, mentioning that he was probably a, a member of AMWORK. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I said, well, how could I verify that? And because there were some key ideas, keywords, in fact, that were in, in this book by Gary from, the, um, from their book of shadows that I know exactly where it came from. But that's an interesting point, too, is that the book of shadows that they used, what you said... If I remember correctly, it was the Book of Shadows by Lady Sheba was their basic yeah, work. Yeah. Uh, how, does, how does that and Sybil Leak, how does that tie here's, into here's where they the go? Here's the deal with Sybil Leak. Sybil Leak was what people now are popularly known as folk witches or cunning men or cunning women. And she's, she was an astute businesswoman and she sort of latched onto Wicker as a as part of one of her businesses. Uh, now, I, I'm not saying that to be cynical. However, she was a real witch. I mean, there's no doubt about it. She came from a family of, of theosophists and her grandmother. And astrologers. And astrologers. Yeah. And uh, she had a Russian relatives on one side of the family. And she claimed that she was initiated in the Pyrenees around the time of the war by her Russian aunt. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It, it, because there's some clashing things there. Uh, and one of the things that both my friend Christine Jones, who was one of the last students of Sybil League, she was like, well, you know what, Chris, I never did go through all of those initiations and circles, she said. And she was from England herself, around from the same place. And she, she said, um, am I really a witch? And I said, well, tell me this, all of your spells worked, haven't they? Yes. Haven't, uh, didn't Sybil train you up? Now, in the uh, older forms, people would apprentice. There, there was none of like what you have now. People, people did apprenticeships and they lived with their, their master or whatever, whatever you wish to call them. And that's how it was with, with Sybil and that's how she taught my friend Christine. And that also accounts for the Book of Shadows for the Catechoven. Janie Kishbaugh, who was the priestess, the original one, she was a bit embarrassed when I saw all of the sources of her Book of Shadows. I recognized Lady Sheba, I recognized um, Paul Hussens, uh, Mastering Witchcraft, uh, and a bunch of other things. But when I came to the rituals themselves, I could see Dr. Santee's hand in several of them, especially the, the Yule Rite. And the coven had a Vestal Virgin. Now, it was just, which I found interesting. It, they had a little girl, it was one of the coven members' children, and she opened up the temple. That no work could be done unless the temple was opened by this little girl. That was out of Amor. Was it? The Cologne. Okay. You need the Cologne for the lodge for all chapter and lodge openings. Okay, I didn't know that. And, because and that, well, and that came out of the Memphis uh, Museum, right of Memphis Museum, Cagliastro, but he used uh, uh, a boy and a girl. Okay, this he was a girl, and uh, she carried the name of Vestal. Vestal, right? Because he called it Cologne Vest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right, and. Uh, so uh, that's, that's how they, they engaged in all that. And they made up the Book of Shadows as they went, to, went along. And I could see that ceremonial magic end with, uh, they had this, they have, well, let's put it this way. One of the chants that they used to do is the Yahweh chant. And, and they were calling on Yahweh to, swinging arms together to raise power. 
And they, they were calling basically on the tetragrams on yod, hey, vow, hey, yod, hey, vow, hey. And they do that to raise energy and then whatever syllable it fell on, that was it. So I, I, I found that interesting because I don't know how many people would do that today. But, but it's, it's uh, interesting for us because we see right after his death, the time of his death in the 80s, we see this movement of the Wicca now becomes the term. Witchcraft is pretty much replaced. Mm -hmm. Like you know, the, this was the stuff, Gavin and Yvonne Frost, the old school stuff from the 70s, great stuff. Or uh, Doreen, Van, Doreen Valiente's, you know, they weren't afraid of the, the W word in the, yeah, the beginning, in, in the beginning yeah. but, you know, especially towards the, the 80s, they started taking the pedal off of the, the witch word, you know what I mean? But, the, it, but that's when you see a transition. Of the, the wicked right. now becomes this kind of uh, generic, kind of a generic Celtic revival. Right, and yeah. until they started doing some digging and touched upon it, this is Leland's book, uh, Radio Gospel of the Witches, and uh, that's when people started to take a shining to some of the more earthy things that actual witches were doing uh, pre-Gardner, and for example, the veneration of the ancestors, that wasn't done in Gardnerian and Alexandrian craft. But then when they wanted to take witchcraft in a crunchier direction, that, that all came back. Now, what, when, you, when you looked at the, the rituals, I haven't seen them in, in years, uh, what was your first impression when you saw them? Mm them all together because there wasn't many them left yeah. there, there was Janie there was Jeannie well the, the uh, everything the whole the whole thing and what was your impression of the the women uh and we'll get back to them because which one which one of them was the author though the one who wrote the the column that was Janie Kishbaugh okay okay Williams yeah maybe let's talk about that instead because that's really interesting yes there was the newsletter you know you could talk about the newsletter and also the column that was published in the Bloomsburg paper. Right, there were two columns actually, Dr. Santee's column called The Country Doctor and Janie Kishpaw Williams, hers was called The Witch's Cattle. And she taught, she just, they published this, what was it, once a week? Yeah, it was quite often. And what she, she wrote about all aspects of witchcraft, herbalism, uh, anything having to do with witchcraft, they printed it that if she wrote it and that you wouldn't see that going over today, even though we think that we're more, op more of an open society today. Back then, we actually got away with it, didn't we? Well, you know, what, I, what I find fascinating is, and I remember them, I remember them and someone because someone showed them to me and it was like you know the memory comes flooding back is at uh, the ESO gas stations they had these small booklets that they would hand out and they would be on reading the tarot uh, developing your psychic powers yeah. crystal balls dream interpretation so this was the uh, the degree to which uh, magic and witchcraft and occultism had really seeped into the popular psyche and had managed to move itself out into the marketing domain. I mean, you're driving up, you get your tank filled up, and you know, somebody hands you one of these, you know, so you get the whole collection. Well, I, I, think about it too. I, even up into the 80s and early 90s, you, if you went into a smoke shop or whatever, there was an, you know, the newsstand, and there, there, invariably there'd be books on, uh, magazines on astrology and... Fate uh, magazine. Fate magazine. Now you can't find any of that. There's just home and garden and all this other stuff. Well, and this is about, part of it has to do then with the survival. This is, this is where this digs into the survival of, of magic and witchcraft in popular culture. 
because we're seeing this in popular culture. Now you have some of the articles that uh, Janie had written um, and there was a newsletter out there. We, we talked a little bit about this in the car. Are these available online anywhere? Can we find these or, or how do we? Oh goodness, I, you mentioned to me that there was actually, uh, was it Gary's go? His, uh, the, the successor, the survivor of the covenant. Up here, her, I believe her name, her craft name is Amber. And uh, I'm, I haven't been in touch with her in a while, so I don't know what she did or didn't do because these books, Gary's books are still in print and you can order them. Now, Gary wasn't making a dime on them because he had them going to some sort of charity or other. I don't know. So I, I have no idea who really owns these anymore. If it, uh, where was I going with that? No, just the, the publications, the newsletter publications. <laughs> newsletter, okay, so there was the Cat's Tale, which was their in-house. Uh, Do you have some? Yeah, I have just have them in bits and pieces. As you can see, this was... You can pass this around if you wish. But this is one... This is one whole issue of the cat's tail. You can see it's rather primitive looking, but the articles are rather good. Uh, the artwork is all homemade and... Fanzine style. Is this, is this, how, they, is this how Fanzines, they actually... Fanzines, yeah. yeah. They would, at once, once a month, they try to do it once a month. The cat's and it would come just like it. this? The, during their, their profit meetings, you know, once a month they get it together, who's going to write what, and then they pass it out to each other. Photocopy, old school. Well, yes. <laughs> and you have to remember, too, that these were people weren't all local. Sure. They were coming from Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, uh, Now, this was all for the Cata. Yes. They had, they had quite How a few. How many members did the Cata have? Does anyone know? I think... I think it wasn't an excess of, uh, I think at one time they had at least 20 that were circulating in and out. I mean, they wanted to keep it to 13, but there were so many people. It's, I don't know who here ever belonged to a coven or a, such a society, but people come and go and some, and even the people who still stick around, there are not always to every a coven meeting every celebration of what? Sure. Was this publication um, available to the public or was it only for the... In-house only. Okay. So how rare is this copy? Uh, rare enough. Uh, there's a fellow in uh, Florida who is who was designated as the coven or this tradition now, this tradition's librarian of sorts, and he has copies of absolutely everything that ever existed. Um, and was, so, was he one of the one of the members? Yeah, yeah, but by long distance. Sure. And one of the newer members. He's a, he was young when I I first met him. Lives in Florida, so he never did get to do much work in Pennsylvania. Now, at, at the time that um, the newspapers started to publish, you know, uh, the Kettle and um, Dr. Frederick's, you know, columns, was there, was there a lot of um, focus being put on Walt Wallopin? Did you see a lot of people migrating into Walt Wallopin so they could try to study under Santee? Or? I understand there were traffic issues like was at it? night because it's a small town and if you see it, it's... Yeah, there's but a... was, it, was it more so just for the gawking or was yeah. it for people that were actually interested in trying to join? The I was told yeah. it was both. That it was, it was, you know, most of the stuff is gawking. It's a bit of, you know, what's the, you know, want to see what, what's happening. but. There were there were sincere people too. What, did he ever accept anybody? That I, oh, I just these are just what I was told that there was a. Well, it it it, it became drove, a spectacle. It, sure. Right, it it drove some people batty because you know they're only a small community and you have all these strangers coming in. But they they couldn't totally shun him, for as much as 
his interests kind of spooked them or irritated them during certain times of the year because he, they, he was their doctor and he treated most of them for absolutely nothing. Yeah. So how, how they just... Could he be at that point? Right. Yeah. Now, here's something that I remember uh, being told, that uh, Sybil Leak uh, had a... They call it a snake spirit, a serpent spirit, that, was, uh, that she had that she is said to have given to Santee. Oh, I, I didn't know about that. And Miss Sashima. Yeah, and I was told that uh, so one individual told me that uh, there was a, a Naga, that's the language they use, uh, a Naga down there. And uh, I'd asked for the location, but uh, they hadn't, uh, they, they were, didn't reply. So that's, have you heard anything about that? No, no, that, that's news to me. Okay. Abby. But she did have her animal familiars that that she put forward were Mr. Hotfoot Jackson, the uh, jackdaw, and her pet boa, uh, Miss Sashima. And I don't know if Miss Sashima has had anything to do with that naga that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, so when, you, when you're out hiking down by the power plant, you know, they're... <laughs> Well, there's many of the, the coven members that were left of the original, they, they didn't think that uh, it would be a good idea to resurrect the coven at the old covenstead because they were leery of the energies being put out by the new Berg power plant that went online around the same time that Dr. Santee passed away, which was 1980. Uh, Gary Lee Hoke, uh, and a few others said that they felt a, a current or something that was coming, emanating from the power plant that warped the, the, the lay energies in that area. Now, today we would call that uh, unverified personal gnosis, but that's... Uh, <laughs> or an opinion. <laughs> an opinion, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But uh, they, they think that the new plant really put out energies that were not uh, conducive to uh, working with nature spirits and stuff that were probably scared away or whatever by what was going on across the Across the, the water, yeah. yeah. Now, when you talk to Gary, you talk to Steve, we haven't mentioned, um, we talked to these other folks who were, were part of this. Um, did you ever at any time uh, look to uh, J.D. and, and consider uh, uh, some part of involvement in, in the coven or resurrecting it on any level? Say that again. Did you, did, you, did you go down there with the intention or... Oh, I did. Yeah. 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 And uh, I, did, I never did make it through any of the, the rites of initiation. Even... And at that point, because I went to every Sabbath that they were still having up here, I saw everything, I knew everything. I, I got to copy Janie's Book of Shadows. And uh, so the, the missing key is, is a personal one here, as far as my status in the coven of the Kata tradition. Uh, Janie believed that I, that she was my mother at one time because she was a strong believer in reincarnation. And she said, you don't have to go through all of this. You used to be my son and you've seen all this anyway, so you're here. <laughs> and that didn't go down well with some people who busted their chops coming up upstate and all this other stuff to to copy line by line and everything and do you wow. know what I mean? So you were made a witch on sight. I was. Yeah, that's like, you know, that's like the Masonic one day class thing that gets into yeah. somebody's car, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> now what other documentation do we have here? Anything of interest to, to share with folks? Well, I have a book coming out sometime it was supposed to be out two years a year or two ago my life with Sybilique 
by Christine Jones. And as I mentioned, Christine Jones was uh, Sybil's last student. And as I mentioned, Christine had an issue with how she was taught because she thought, well, aren't I supposed to go through three rites and all this other stuff? And she raised her up as a witch just by, by tutelage. So, uh, this will come out soon and it makes a rather, rather good reading because if you are interested in Sibylique, you'll understand what kind of magic she herself was practicing. Her style of practice was very simple. Aside from what, whatever she told people about Sabbaths and stuff, she did a lot of meditation and most of her work was done through mind power and meditation. There was, she hardly ever had anything fancy. And even though some of her work seems simplistic, thank you so much. Even though it seems simplistic, actually her spells are, are not easy to do. Maybe you could elaborate on that. Please. Uh, okay. Well, there is a, a fire conjuration that she had. And just as one example. And what she would do is she'd put herself in tune with the, uh, the spirit of the fire that wherever she was, in front of a fireplace, a candle, whatever, and she could control the flame. She could light it up, put it out, um, um, there is one uh, picture of her in her book, The Complete Art of Witchcraft, where she was in, uh, what was it, San Francisco, mm -hmm. where she... Raising a wind, right? That, that was one. She was, she could raise wind and then, but it was the other one where she was sitting in front of the fireplace. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, on Russian Hill, and this is how this is how she did things, and she did it all with this up here, and all of her incantations were just very brief, very simple. They'd be mantras. They she just say them over, over, over again, and until she got the result that she wanted, whether it was raising up fire, putting it out. Uh, which is something we see with powwow work too. It's people who specialize, as you know, in working with fire and putting it out. Uh, what? Well, which is important because you know, these folks didn't have a, a fire brigade or a fire no. company. I mean, when, when a fire hits the barn, you're in trouble. That's right. Yeah. And, and that would be fitting in with the period in which she's coming out of, in which... Um, much of the new thought literature, which is focusing on those mental capacities. That's right. is, is, yeah. I think, uh, who was it, uh, particularly the book Mental Magic, which quite large book is uh, some consider really uh, one of the best books on the subject at that time. And even today, right. it doesn't change. One of her favorite books, Sybil's, uh, was the great book of Hindu magic and the occult, is that what it's called? That's what uh, Christine told me, that it was... Yes, and that book was very popular. It was plagiarized by uh, De Lawrence, and that was the book with which Leshevsky, uh pulled the ritual from the Heptameron for his first and famous, first and second the famous evocations. Oh. They were pulled from that text. I saw his, I saw his copy. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, I have a, a copy myself. Um, Do you have an old one or a new one? Oh, a, a, a new one that's that looks just like the, the old one, okay. the hardcover. So uh, maybe we're getting too far into Sybil League and too far away from... Mm -hmm. well, that well, what I think that the, the relationship is interesting because we see that we go to Sybil, we go to Christine, we see this transition of the, the different... Uh, craft ideas and how they're evolving and changing 
and, and sometimes just because we see with Santi, the people he was working with wanted Wicca. Right. That's what they wanted, so that's what he gave them. Which brings maybe to the question, uh, you know, he was a genius. Mm -hmm. So when he is developing his system, uh, how much of his How much of his genius is making this exception or different from what else was out there? I mean, that, that we see from him personally. Because he can, he's bringing so much of the classical information to it. Right. Uh, you can see it in the, the coven rituals, most especially, like I said, the Yule Rite. Uh, and... Uh, what I want to say about it really is these people that we're all talking about now, Santi, Sibulik, even Ray Buckman, uh, Leo Motello, and, and all of these folks, many of the younger generations now are forgetting about them, they, that they don't, that they may not even know that they exist, whereas maybe today say, so, like up in Salem, Lori Cabot is, is quite, uh, she was quite famous, and she is now, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but you and I talked about that quite a bit. It's, well, this is the, the importance of understanding the history so you understand what you're getting as a teaching. You know, so if you if you get a teaching and you're getting it from someone like Santi or, or Buckland, uh, as simplistic as the Buckland material is, he was quite uh, traveled, learned, and, and genius in his own right. Mm -hmm. So when when they're when they're cultivating and, and crafting, no pun intended, these these practices, they're bringing a lot more to it than we see. Uh, there's a lot more behind that than we we end up with. Oh, yeah. And that you, when you ask, you know, where does this come from? How do I practice it? And what can I expect as a result? Uh, they can give you some degree of an answer. Whereas if we look at someone who just decides I want to study magic or witchcraft on my own, and, and you go to whatever the uh, Llewellyn Book of the Month is, uh, as I often <coughs> say, you, there's no... When, when you fill out, when you write a book and you fill out the, the author questionnaire for the publisher, they never ask you, does this work? That's not right. a concern. It's how many copies can you sell? So, you know, when you, so when we're looking at what we could call living tradition or living, you know, perpetuation, right. that's when there's a certain degree of accountability. And, and, you know, whether, whether, we, whether we believe about Buckland or not and some of the things he wrote or is kind of irrelevant. The same thing with Santee. There was at least a degree of accountability there because you, you have a relationship to this person. You know, you're, you're meeting them, you're seeing them. And, and even more so with Santee because he didn't publish anything really other than the Devil's no. Wager. His, his magical texts were, they were just part of the group and that was it. So really what, what we're talking about are, are transmissions of, or what many people, especially in Sufism, call the golden chain. Uh, or just like Christian apostolic succession, going right, having to, you can account for who was before you and before them, and uh, Gardnerian and Alexandrian-based witchcrafts, they, they keep things very traditional. It's, it's still what they call now a British traditional witchcraft, and it's uh, they still do things the old way, according to how Gardner or Alex Sanders did their thing back in the sixties. Which is interesting because when we again we're we going back to because we're going back to Sybil and we're going back to Santi with the three degrees, and we see that within that context these three degrees of initiation really don't exist until Gardner compiles them. That's right. They're pulled, probably Crowley probably wrote them. And 
then Doreen Valiente goes back and sanitizes them. She gets rid of the Crowley influence. But we're seeing that as really as a peculiar extension of Freemasonry. That within that context, there's, there's similarities in the rituals to Masonic initiation. Not complete, guys. There's some more interesting things in this one. But we, we see that, again, that kind of overlapping of, of beliefs and ideas. So, so even the notion of a formal initiatic transmission is relatively new, at least within the, the witchcraft. Yeah, in, in contemporary gardenarianism, as it always been, you have to be able to provide your, your uh, bona fides that, that uh, you can prove who your priestess was and hers and hers and hers and hers until it goes right back to the old man himself. Yeah. And it is uh, the, line, the, the priestess initiation is the one that matters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. No, well, now, did Dr. Sensi, did he kind of leave any bit of a legacy? I mean, as far as children or anybody that carried on? in his way? No. No, he had... And ended with him, or whatever traditions, and kind of guidelines guide, guide he was going with, he, he, he took with him. The only people he had that carried on were uh, what was left of his coven by the time he was getting ill and finally passed away in 1980, April of 1980. So he, he was married once and he had one natural child and her name was Ruth. Ruth passed away at an early age. Uh, I think she was in her 20s or something. And then he married again to a lady named um, Betty Addis and they adopted a, a refugee child from Germany Eastern Germany, I believe. And her nickname was Tao, T-A-O, but it was the child's rendering of the word T-A-I-L because that, when she was little, she had a long ponytail. And whatever happened to Tao, and I don't know what her real name is. She's, you know, I think there was something in the will. Yeah, there I was, the yeah. Will. Other question. Yeah. Right. Wasn't it like a rumor that Teo, like this is Santi, said he was Adolf you know, Hitler's doctor and he had smuggled her out of Germany? You know what? I did. I didn't want to bring that that talk, but no, please do. I mean, feel free. Like, All right. Free. Well, you see, when I wrote this, the, there were so there were so many things I had to sanitize. Now. We don't sanitize anything here. We like it dirty, dirty. Okay, well, according to absolutely everybody, he was a homeopath, a homeopath to Adolf Hitler in the early days. And, uh... <clears throat> was this, not to interrupt, but was this before the Civil League had come out and ordained him as, as a high priest? Oh, goodness, this was a long time this ago. Been, this had to have been the early 20s. The, the early 20s. 20s. Right, right. When, he, when he was uh, going to school in Berlin. In yeah, and he wound up doing homeopathy for Hitler, but this is before Hitler became Hitler, Hitler as we understand him. And when it started to get bad, when it when he saw which dire direction it was going, he got out of there, and uh, I think that's when Taya comes into the picture. I didn't know if she was a rescue from East Germany, a refugee from East Germany, or if he took her out. I, th I think that's where the problems come in, though, because like we we have. But that was an awfully long time ago, and Taya was uh, around and young around the time of the 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 sick, the fifties or nineteen sixties. Yeah, I think the problem with the oral tradition, though, is like even with Gary's book, he mentions him meeting. Uh, he met Blavatsky. He couldn't have met Blavatsky. Blavatsky was dead. Then. You know, Blavatsky wouldn't have been alive at the time when he's said to have met her. 
you know. When so did she die? It was well before. Uh, uh, we had someone look it up, but it was you would have, would not have been it was dead before the twenties. So you you have some issues there with. It's interesting with Gary because Gary is writing down what he says he was right. told by. Uh, and that's where I got my information yeah. from Gary as to to whom. Right. And the, the, so the, the notion of, the, and this is where we see the stories where there is kind of a, you know, I whisper in your ear, you whisper in, and by the time right. I get to the back of the room, it's, yeah. it's something else. Telephone. Yeah, the telephone, we're playing telephone. Right. Uh, and I think the character of Santi is interesting enough without With, without all the, the, the ex- little bells and whistles of high strangeness. mythology mythology yeah. and high strangeness yeah yeah i mean the the person who told me that there's an aga out there at least had a connection to santi and, and is a relatively reasonable source but even there it's hard to get more details and you know it's interesting because we talk about these folks all the time it's interesting who you you find out when you're talking to them who, who is kind of maybe elaborating or who is shifting or changing their, yeah. their sense, the roles and the stories and their understandings. Yeah. Right. Uh, after I learned about Dr. Senti, I, I made a, I made it a point to try to find him or at least what was left of his coven. And it, it was all hit and miss. Uh, and eventually I, I put, I don't even know what kind of forum it was. This was before we had websites and all sorts of things. More like, uh, what were they called? Uh, oh, yeah, this, before this, uh, websites, what were they? Bulletin boards. Bulletin boards. Yeah. And that, that's how I found Steve. Yeah. I and found Steve through a bulletin board. Yeah. And he was very helpful in a lot of areas. A fellow who knew, a fellow he's listed in one of the books, he's very helpful in uh, some of these areas. Uh, he, but he's you a t- member. But you get, it's interesting because you get a different view. Right. Yeah, his view of the, the genesis of the Covenant of the Kata is different than Gary Hoax, uh, which I would like to know more of from his side, but he's not always terribly forthcoming. Or friendly. Or friendly, yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to say that, but I, I mean, it's... Because <laughs> I told him. <laughs> yeah, he... He's, he's a hard one to get anything out of. He, he likes to make a game of in getting information. You, well, well, generally, what was... Do you have, can you give a synopsis, maybe, of what was his, what was his idea of the genesis of the Covenant of Cabot? Well, he said that... What Gary put forward, a lot of a lot of things he just took as gospel, mm-hmm. like Sibylle being initiated into a coven in France, right. in the Pyrenees, in called the the Red Dragon. Yes, and he he was really stuck on that, and. I couldn't ever get more information about that except what Sibylle herself wrote about it and that she was initiated in the Red Dragon in France by her, one of her aunts on the Russian side of her family. That's all you got. Yeah. Because according to her, she was not purely English. She, Anglo, she considered herself Anglo, um, Irish-Russian, Gaelic-Russian. She always put the Irish first and the Russian right next to it. And she claimed that a lot of her craft came from Russia. Well, then how did this affect uh, that, that genesis, though, of the Covenant of the Kata? How does that affect it? Well, in, in the way, like I mentioned, with the creation of the Book of Shadows, uh, because there was no Book of Shadows to give them. All, all she gave them is what is how she trained up my friend Christine. That's what they got. And when I questioned Janie about the sources that I saw of her BOS, well, I, she just was sort of like this and gave me these little eyes, like, where, how did you know it was cobbled together? And 
and that's just how it was. If you wanted a, a book of shadows, many people started with Paul Hassan's. Uh, they, they copied, they made a book just like Paul Hassan taught them to do and the same, the same uh, sigil, the same pentacle in the, the beginning. Which is a good book, by the way. And, it is. And, and there's several book. people who, several people I know who I respect who, who think very highly of that book. Actually, so, that's one, one of my Vadi Mekums. I, I won't part with it. I have yeah. an old hard, first edition hardcover, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just one of those that are, that are gritty, but if you do it, if you follow what he teaches, then you are doing witchcraft, mm -hmm. so. And which book is this? Mastering the Art of Witchcraft by Paul Hassan. H U S O N, which which brings to the kind of wraps us up for the night because is really at the heart of it all. Then is because we're dealing with so many different practices, and the, the key of it is what is the attitude of the practitioner? What is the the attitude of the, of the witch or the, the witch uh, or magician? And I think that uh, Grippa said it very well. He said that you know that a ritual performed poorly but with tremendous faith and confidence is far superior to a ritual performed uh, exactly well but without any. Right, right. Uh, and, and practitioners going way back, they had that faith that just like we don't have to think about if the lights are going to go on if we flip the switch. We know that most of the time the lights are going to go on and that's how it was with the, the older practitioners, they didn't have to think about it. They just were taught and it was drilled into their heads that this works. So with power of mind and whatever, it, if you believe that there are actually f separate familiar spirits, that sort of thing, which I personally do, that those such entities can be passed along uh, uh, that's that's how I I think it worked because, and this is just as a little, well maybe not a little side note. Do I have time to sure, tell them about the? You have as much time as you want. Okay. There's, there's no limitation. All right, I'm going to write a companion to the Red Church, and I brought a few here for purchase if anybody wants one. And there's going to be a companion volume because the original editor didn't put mo those things in and left some things out. So there's going to be a, a smaller volume. And there's going to be more about Hexerai, um, PA German witchcraft, as opposed to uh, just healing work. And I was, I was told a very strange story. Uh, I was giving a talk at a place ironically called the Red Church, and it was down in PA Dutch country. I won't mention any personal names, but I'll just call the woman, I don't know, Frances. I know her real name. She claims that her mother and her grandmother were witches of the old sort, that they did call on the devil, that grandma was actually attended Sabbaths with a shadowy form, sort of ectoplasmic, that was in the shape of the traditional sab sabbatic goat, and that they had intercourse, and it was cold as ice. You know, the the just all those, just like in all of the old uh, stories about witches from the early modern period. And she said that she watched her grandmother take a rag, uh, just an, a, a tea rag, put it over the, uh, a chair, a kitchen chair, but it, you know, it's flats. And she put herself backwards, so she's sitting like this, and then she starts working it like others and put a pail under there, and all, the, all comes all this milk. It's called milking the cow. Milking the cow. The magic. Yeah. And that's what uh, a lot of people in agrarian societies with witches, you know, they were, when a cow started bleeding instead of giving milk, 
they were accused, people who were known to be healers or whatever were accused of witchcraft, but obviously if, you, if you're willing to believe what this acquaintance of mine told me, it really works if you know how to do it. If you know how to apply yourself, you can milk a cow from tell, two miles away. But tell the rest of the story in terms of how the, the transference, how she tried to transfer this to her granddaughter. She tried to transfer the power to her granddaughter and she was absolutely frantic. She didn't want to die with the, with the power of witchcraft. It was granted to her by what she called the devil and she tried all sorts of ways to pass the art to her, her granddaughter. Her daughter wanted nothing to do with it and became very religious. Funny thing is that the grandmother was active in the local church. So she, I, she was having feet in both ends. Was, was, she, hiding, was she hiding under the church? Maybe no, but I mean, it was it, going to church was the the thing to do because people expected to see you there. Well, I know, I know, just from you know, me and my cousins, like uh, family history, you know, uh, with their generation American. You know, our grand our grandparents were born here, but our great grandparents were in Italy. You know, they were Sreghieri, Sreghion. So uh, there were times which the, there was a time over in Italy. You know, they called. The, the burning times, or the, the, the black times, where you know they were like really waging war on like the gypsies and the Italian witches. You know, the only place that uh, they could find sanctuary was in the town of Benevento. Uh, a lot of people couldn't get to Benevento. Our great grandparents didn't want to go to Benevento. They just wanted to flee because our great grandparents were very known, and they were uh, they were very good healers. They were very good thieves. They were gypsies, you know. You have, you have the good with the bad, it was the way of the light. So they came here to America and they hid underneath Roman Catholicism. The reason why they hid underneath Roman Catholicism is because they had a very strong belief that Catholicism took a lot of our deities, turned them into their own deities. Mm -hmm. So our great grandparents would go to church, and as the other attendees were praying to one thing, our great grandparents were praying to say the Diana, roots. yeah, right, right, Diana and Sir Lunas, you know. Um, so I just had a question if, if that's what maybe she was doing, you know. If she had well, I, I, I her can't her speak for her because I, uh, you know, she's been, <clears throat> she was, been, she's, she died in the 50s, you know. Uh, the daughter absolutely didn't want it, and she didn't want to die with witchcraft because she knew that. One, she, she would go to hell, according to her belief. These are now, these are people who actually had spectral encounters with whatever you want to think that they were. And uh, one of the strangest fixtures of the story, you have to realize that these were German reformed Protestants. And they didn't do a lot of bells and whist whistles with their services, especially they didn't do mass. Sure. Okay, they had, they had communion service, maybe once a year or whatever. But the strangest part about their coven, the grandmother's coven, was this, that they practiced black mass. Where, now, where, how, how that came into it, I don't know, because they were German reformed, but they were practicing black mass. What, what county was this in? Was Schuylkill or Carver? Um, where I was at the time, that, that was Carbon. I don't know where the, so, the grandmother. Because I remember the, the, the one, one of the first exorcists I ever interviewed uh, was, uh, or, or actually was an exorcist, he was a Lutheran minister kind of shrugged in thrust into an exorcism and in fact he recently retired i was going to contact him to oh, see oh that yeah yeah that was in the, the carbon county area and he, i remember him saying very specifically because he's you don't understand these people don't understand these these germans here they have a whole different way of doing things they have a whole different view on stuff and and, and it's important to understand that those views you know were were, were, were permeated uh you know the the, the community you know and, and he was quite surprised at the degree to which uh 
magic and witch wars permeated the, the community in which he, you know, had yeah, he didn't see, he didn't see it. Yeah, that that came out of like, wow, where did, where where did they put me? You know, right, and so many seminaries are putting uh, new clerics in a bind because they don't know they don't teach them how to do exorcisms or any of that stuff to clean up a mess. Yeah. Which, which goes back to what we said earlier about why it's important when you do undertake any kind of esoteric practice or study is to have some time, kind of uh, get to know the people involved because you're only like the, you know, the company you keep, like Grandma says, uh, and, and kind of understand what am I getting involved with, who am I getting involved with, what am I doing, how do I do it, what can I expect from it so that you can save yourself a lot of trouble in the, in the long run. But, uh, I don't know, it's a little bit after five. All right, excuse me, it's a little bit after eight. It's five after eight. Five, uh, five after eight. Uh, I guess, uh, does anyone have any other questions? Because if not, we'll end now. And uh, you can feel free to grab us at the time. Chris was very kind to bring some books. I really encourage you to get a copy of his book, The Red Church. It is a spectacular volume. And uh, I've got a few monographs over here that you may find them interesting. Just real quick, yes. before we wrap up, I'm going to this entire session tonight like in regards to Santi and... Uh, oh, yes. A toast to Santi. Ah, this is perfect. I would, I would like to do a, a, a toast to Santi. Yes. We must have this. And to this, I will tell you... The, the power of the... Uh, the power of the... Good, the welcome. spirit of the grid. The spirit of the grid. And Mark, you did say that you were going to, to speak a little bit on the powers of the spirits. Whenever you, you know, whenever you're involved with stuff, particularly anything mind altering, any of these chemicals, Just tell me always uh, remember that you should own it, not let it own you. And that's why when? we see that. Uh, Tommy, when? That's good, right there. That's enough. That the uh, the power of the grave is uh, really good at opening up the heart. But also opening up other areas too. So they buy carefully and with a certain amount of sacredness or sacerdotalness to it. That's why it's used so much in uh, both known liturgies and forbidden liturgies. And in fact, in the well, we see it in the Catholic Church, of course, the Protestant churches where we use the wine. We see that it comes from the lineage of Melchizedek. The righteous king, but we also see in the highest tantric circles, the high tantric feast, it's one of the five essentials. So, if I can have everyone's attention, we will raise our glass in honor of Dr. Frederick Lamont Santee, Janie Kishpa. Sybil Leak, all the wonderful folks who made the Covenant of the Cata possible, all the way back to, we'll say, the ancient times of forgetfulness, and hopefully that it will move forward into the future in some way, and that this will inspire you to your journey and help you in your path to coming as well. Salute. Salute. Or someone to be. You know, he used to drink this, but nobody's ever seen him get drunk off of it. Exactly. What is this? It's called Sherry. That's Sherry. Sherry. Yeah.